Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of the Conscious Grief series. Today, I am joined by Mason Summit, who is a musician and one of the few men that I always get to speak on these series about grief. So I'm always so grateful, you know, to have a bit of a mix up and to hear from a man. So Mason, thank you very much for being here. Thank you for having me. And I know you because I interviewed your mom, Susan Hayden, for the last series. And your father, Christopher Allport, died um, tragically when you were only 11 years old. So I was thinking to begin with, um, you know, could you could you take us back to that time when you were 11 and you found out that your father had died? Yes. So it was kind of over the course of a weekend. Uh, My father was an avid outdoorsman and he was skiing about an hour outside of Los Angeles in a place called Wrightwood. And so I was at school. It was a Friday and kind of later on towards the evening, kind of when you'd expect for him to be returning. Uh, He was out with his best friend, who was also our neighbor across the street. Um, We found out that he was missing via a call from the person he was skiing with. So there was a night where we didn't know what was going on. It obviously didn't look good, but there were avalanche warnings that whole day. Like people had already been in avalanches, but he kind of did not heed that. Um, And so my mom went to the mountain while they were kind of searching, She stayed there overnight. And I was with my grandparents. And the next morning uh, was when they found the body. And I found out kind of my mom called my grandma and I was only hearing like what my grandma was saying and looking at her face and saw kind of the face and her reaction to the news. And so that's when I found out. And uh, it was a hectic weekend. A lot of people in and out of the house, you know, the whole like bringing over platters of food and that kind of thing and very crowded, a lot of energies just very hectic. Um, but yeah, I, I guess it's a unique experience in that it was so out of the blue and sudden and obviously kind of a, a pretty uncommon way to die, you know, but he was a sporty person. So in those kinds of situations, Mm -hmm. but when it happens like that, you don't have that kind of time to like say goodbye or kind of prepare for what's coming. It is just your life is changed in a very short span of time. Yes, completely. And I <laughs> so relate actually, because my dad died very suddenly with no warning um, of a heart attack. And I was 11, uh, I was nine, sorry, you were 11. And I also remember that very clearly, like a house full of people and um, everybody kind of coming together and grieving together. And and like you said, you had that look on your grandmother's face was obviously something that's so memorable to you. Um, Do you remember at that time sort of internalizing things or thinking this is how I'm going to respond or anything of that nature? I definitely remember <clears throat> feeling like I was supposed to uh, put on a brave face. I mean, we're like, I was never kind of told to like not express myself, you know, definitely crying and all that was normalized and um, not discouraged, but I felt like I had to say, you know, to my mom, like, we're going to get through this. And even if that's not necessarily what I was feeling myself at the time, 
Um, and being at that age, that kind of on the cusp of adolescence, it just kind of um, changed my demeanor a lot, um, I think, which was probably pretty disturbing for people who knew me to see. And I think that if it had happened a few years later, I probably would have been in more serious trouble, you know, being not such a little kid. Um, mainly, and this is true for me in other facets of mental illness, that my grief would manifest itself in very physical ways. I got a lot of headaches. I got sick a lot. Um, and also, I just became very angry and would definitely take it out at school, like rebelling at school and take it out on my mom. A lot of my anger at the situation was directed at people around me. Mm -hmm. And at that age, you can't really, you don't really know how your mind works enough to realize, oh, this is coming from that. You know, I wasn't using critical thinking or kind of analyzing like where these impulses were coming from. I was just kind of acting on my feelings. Mm -hmm. And that's why I say if I had been like 16 or 17, it probably would have manifested in ways that were more destructive, more permanent, you know, of an impact. But I still kind of had time to process and go through that before moving more into my adult development. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I guess it's also very difficult when with children, because it's like hard to, to discern what is the grief and what is you being a child and growing into, you know, an adolescent. Um, exactly. Yeah. And that behavior. Now I know that you and your mom found our house mm -hmm. and would you share with the people who are listening like what is our house and what did you make of it and make of that yeah it's a grief group uh where you are put in a small group kind of usually by age I think at least I was for sure and it's about people are there for different periods of time I was there for a long time, like two years or so, you start at least six months after the death. And the group leader is just kind of a civilian who's been given some training and volunteered. And uh, <clears throat> I think my group obviously was a lot different than the adult group. We would do different activities, a lot of kind of arts and crafts type activities ways to talk about different facets of grief and process it and share it with each other. I was kind of the class clown of my group. I mean, it's pretty tricky with kids that age to get them to focus and kind of to encourage introspection and things like that. But I think the main thing very fundamentally is just being around people that are in the same or similar situation that you are. Um, even if you have like the knowledge statistically of like death and obviously you're not the only person who this has happened to just to be around people who might kind of understand more where you're at, I think is yeah. very healing. Very healing. Do you still have friends from that time? Did you retain any? Of Not, I stayed in touch a little bit. Not so much currently. Um, but yes, I did stay in touch with different people um, from the group. Definitely. Through, like in the few years after mm. the group ended. I know. It's such an amazing um, resource to have, you know, I mean, you lit, you were raised, lived and raised in the city of LA, which is, a, I would say, one of the more sort of advanced places um, for self-development and um, thinking about our emotional well-being. Yeah. 
Um, also, LA is the home of actors and actresses, and your dad was a prolific actor and in the public eye. Um, did that affect you in any way, like having media attention? Um, honestly, he was not really high profile enough to attract like, I mean, I definitely it gave me empathy for other people like children of more high profile people like when Philip Seymour Hoffman died or even like Michael Jackson, um, just that the paparazzi onslaught. I didn't know. I didn't have any of that. Definitely. But um, I that would definitely affect me, I think, thinking of how the children of more famous people in L.A. were treated uh, because it's such a it's just the industry is just looking for content mm -hmm. and um, people aren't given, you know, privacy to grieve and people aren't like children of people who are, you know, acting out and stuff aren't really treated with any sort of empathy or understanding. So I think I'm more empathized with that than really any firsthand experience. I mean, there were definitely articles and obituaries and there was a huge, my dad's memorial was very big. Uh, and it was at a local movie theater that was very close to my family. And it was just overflowing with people. I think that was meaningful, definitely. I mean, you have a lot of people, older people that you don't really know at all, just coming up to you and telling you like how much uh, this person meant to them. And as a child, you don't really get to know your parent in that way mm -hmm. as a person, like on their level. So that, and then definitely in the years since, you know, talking to people who knew my dad, that fills in a bigger picture than you have in a parent-child relationship. Yeah, I, I so relate to that. My father also had a very big funeral and my father died 30 years ago, but even more recently, I've been reconnecting with people that he worked with and speaking to friends of his because as you say like it takes a while for us to want to get to know our parents on an adult to adult level and yeah. um yeah sometimes I don't know how you feel but sometimes I feel a little like as time goes on I mean the grief it changes and there are certain I know that you've just moved uh states for example you know and these sorts of moments do you think like about your dad and think kind of it would be nice to talk to him about this and definitely I think I mean I've like watched his movies and shows that he was in and things like that that weren't necessarily appropriate for an 11 year old mm -hmm. uh, and that's that's nice for me uh the main way that I stay connected to my memory of my dad is through music mm. uh, because I have like some of his instruments and equipment, stuff like that. And uh, as a songwriter currently, I think it's really important, those formative memories and seeing creativity in the household and having that be normalized is something to do, writing songs, writing poetry. So I can't underestimate the impact of that. Um, but yeah, talking to people, even like my brother, my older brother, um, will fill in kind of pieces, you know, that I never got to know. Mm. And as you get older, there's also memories that are fading, you know, so it's kind of at the same time, new things are coming in and old things are kind of leaving. Um, I love what you're sharing about creativity because I think that that can be such a profound way of, um, you know, turning our pain into something beautiful. And did you, were you writing music from a very young age, like even when your dad was still alive? 
Towards the end of his life, I was definitely trying to write songs. I had made some attempts at lyrics and things like that, or come up with songs in my head. Um, or we even like wrote a few kind of jokey songs, you know, um, not anything complete, but I was definitely on the cusp of that. Mm -hmm. And I started to write uh, like he got me a tape recorder, a little one of those with a microphone and uh, just like a Radio Shack thing. Mm -hmm. And we would learn uh, songs together, covers of songs, Beatles songs. And that kind of got me started on the track of like home recording. And I started to write, I wrote my first complete song, I would say almost a year after he died. Mm -hmm. So I was around 12 and wow. kept going with that uh, ever since. Yeah, that's amazing that you were so, so little and really utilized that creative part of yourself. Yeah, I wouldn't say I was necessarily engaging with like my deepest emotions, you know, but I was definitely learning the process of the craft mm -hmm. of writing. And how was it, um, you know, being raised without your dad? Like, what were the things that you missed most about having a dad? Or I seem to remember, like, your mum putting certain things in place, having yeah, sort of role models. Yeah, that's, yeah, there was definitely an effort. Like, I got a guitar teacher very soon after he died and honestly that definitely elevated my musicianship i think i'm frankly i'm a better musician than i think i would be if my dad had been my only teacher right guess, um, i mean he was great but he wasn't like a guitar teacher you know yeah. and um started going to a one-on-one -on -one therapy in addition to our house. I definitely had figures in my life. It was kind of like a communal effort. My mom and my dad always had a big community of friends and people who could model different elements uh, for me. But it was hard. It's hard not to have two parents, you know, because they kind of balance each other out in a lot of ways. Um, although my parents were frequently at odds in terms of their parenting style. So I think to have the, the part, the role that was filled by my dad gone, like that's a really hard adjustment to make. Mm -hmm. And obviously much more of a strain on my mom. There's less time, I guess, for just kind of leisurely parent child like activity because you only have you have one person kind of responsible for running your life instead of a divided workload so right. it's a huge strain on the parent mm -hmm. who's also dealing with the grief you know that you're going through but a parent doesn't have necessarily even as much time or freedom to to examine that because they have this huge responsibility on their hands all of a sudden. I mean, more, you know, double the responsibility on their hands. Yeah, I know. And just that whole thing of having one parent that's like good cop and one parent that's bad yes. cop. And yeah, exactly. And um, so how would you say, you know, you're, 25 year old man now like um the the grief has changed over the course of the years and where do you feel you are with it now I think the things that you miss over time kind of change definitely as an adult there are things I wish that I could share with my dad and there are also I don't know your feelings change there was a lot of anger for a long time that I kind of had to let go of, but that's still mostly what I examine in terms of the grief relationship in my songs, the kind of feelings that are harder to express um, verbally, I guess, like resentment and 
anger and confusion and things like that. And just, um, it was a bittersweet milestone. Yeah. When, when more, the time had passed that I'd lived like more of my life, uh, without my dad than with him, you know, when I was 22 and he died when I was 11 and it had been 11 years. Um, and also it's obviously the framework for, like it's my first experience with grief, but then you experience grief throughout your life uh, with other people in different ways. Um, having pets die, to be honest. Um, last year I had, I know you have a dog, but I had, my partner and I had rats, pet rats, domestic rats. And I have not felt as much grief. I know this is crazy for people to hear because I'm talking about a rat. Mm -hmm. um, but having those animals that I cared for um, die last year triggered my grief response in a way that had not happened since uh, that loss. And I have had like other family members die and such, but um, that was just uh, a different kind of grief, obviously, but losing a pet really, uh, I don't know, re-engaged me with just the big, you know, life and death kind of questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is amazing how that can happen um, and take us right back. And then we go through the whole sort of process again in a completely different way and you know while you're talking it's I'm just thinking of people who are listening who perhaps have got a, got an 11 year old boy mm. whose dad has died and I wonder what advice you might offer offer them well um God, that's a good question. Um, I would say uh, I'd like to advocate personally for psychiatry. I know that America is very over-medicated, but being on SSRIs for the past several years has made a huge difference in my life. And I think it would have been very helpful at that age because I was particularly I think kind of erratic um I would say just be open to all outlets um encourage creativity and the outdoors um yeah I mean it's everyone is different but I would say get outside mm. and uh I think animal love is very powerful, very healing and the feeling of caring for something like an animal, I think could be very helpful, but more than anything, I mean, I think everyone should go to therapy regardless of where they are in their life or if they think they need it. I would encourage therapy and I would say, don't just stick with one therapist. If you know, like you have to find the right one um find one that clicks and encourage creativity um as a method to examine your grief yeah you know because you might find yourself feeling or expressing something that you didn't know was there mm -hmm. yeah in a way of just exploring your emotional range with your creativity um, yeah, thank you so much for all of that. That was a really yeah. great answer. And I, too, you know, never, I think people feel like there's such a stigma around taking antidepressants and feeling like they should, you know, manage to do it without. And I always advocate for people who need to take medication to take it and really not worry about it. Um, and, and then I was also thinking as you were talking about, um, you know, do you feel like you have a relationship with your dad who's on the other side? Do you talk to him 
or do you celebrate him at any times in the year? Do you sort of have a continuing we relationship? We definitely had um, on different anniversaries. It's it's really important for us. We've um, usually commemorated with our neighbors who were kind of like in his real inner circle. And uh, my dad just loved being around people and loved food. And so we do things like that. Uh, we've spread his ashes in different places at the ocean and such. Um, and I think just very recently, um, we were on the road en route to Nashville and stayed with my brother and his family for about three weeks. And I think that was very special. Um, the, you know, like I see my little nephews kind of referring to my dad and I, being curious about him and wanting to know like different things. And yeah, there's, there's a bond between me and my brother that's, it's just, I don't know, it's a weird feeling to be like the only two that like, I, it's hard to explain, but um, that I felt like there was a, a process that more unspoken than spoken, you know, just about the people who like knew him, you know, connecting and just every so often would share an anecdote or something. Um, but I don't really have a much of a spiritual life in terms of uh, thinking about like heaven or uh, spirits and stuff like that. But I mean, there's, you know, if, if people do, there's no harm in it. Um, mm. For me, I, it doesn't scare me or, or sadden me to think that death is just like it. So I, I think I'm sure my dad's death had had something to do with how I think about mortality. You know, I think in many ways it's made me more accepting and less fearful mm -hmm. of that reality than people I know who haven't experienced anything like that. Um, just the knowledge that we're, we're always you know, kind of next to death and that it could happen at any time, I think can be a positive thing and encourage us to just live our lives, you know, while we can. Yeah. Um, but my relationship to his memory definitely comes out most in the music making. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I really loved that, what you shared about your you know, the next generation that's coming through your nephews and, and nieces and how that sort of does reintroduce these relatives of ours who are not here anymore, because that's very much happened with my sister's children. And we very much, they very much talk about their grandparents, you know, and um, yeah. it's really, it's really sweet. It's really a lovely thing how that continuation through the next generation can and does happen if if you're willing to you know embrace that within the family yeah. oh yeah I mean I'm definitely a, a proponent of like talking about things you mm -hmm. know not like oh, I can't imagine what it would be like if it was like oh we don't mention that mm -hmm. you know it shouldn't be a big deal um I would yeah I would tell my little nephew anything that he wanted to know I think having people like it's it's obviously really sad that my dad never got to have grandchildren um while he was alive mm. but you can see definitely see parts of him in them and uh in me and my brother yeah and then like you were sharing about your music really being you know, potentially the sort of tragic death of your father, sort of a catalyst for your work, your purpose, your yeah. your calling as a musician here, which is a really beautiful thing that came out from that. Yes. And he had really already started, like, we would go play open mic nights when I was very young, like nine and 10, and he would accompany me. 
And that was really my first introduction to like playing music with other people and uh, performing in front of strangers at a coffee shop. So it was already kind of, it had started, you Mm. know, um, I'm lucky that at least I got that, you know, couple years where we could share that together. And obviously you think of how that would change and how, you know, like it would be great to play now that I'm actually like good at my instrument. But at the same time, he definitely started me on that path that I continued. Mm. Yeah, I think just for all parents, like trying to find something that your kids enjoy, it's such a foundation for life. You know, what brings you by? Um. And I always like to end these interviews with the same question. And it's just that you're in, because this is called the Conscious Grief Series. So it's really what what's your interpretation of that phrase, conscious grief? Mm, wow. So much of my grief, I guess, has been unconscious, you know, but the revelations always happen when you do start to kind of think about it more. I mean, if if my grief were just always unconscious, it could come out in negative ways. You know what I mean? I think nowadays I do try to be more conscious about it in that I can kind of see the through line, especially looking back on my younger self, seeing how much of uh, my behavior and my personality was really a direct, uh, reaction. Um, I find it interesting to kind of examine ourselves and and look at the cause and effect between different events and kind of how we are, how we end up. And I guess my grief is conscious in that Oh God, I don't know what this answer is, but um, there's, it's, there's kind of a bittersweet thing when you like go a day or two and you're like, oh, I haven't like thought about that. You know, you kind of, I find myself kind of like not wanting sometimes to let go or like feeling almost guilty of moving on and letting go of like the worst parts of grief because it almost feels like we're letting the actual person go, but that's not the case. You know, Uh, I think that's what conscious grief means to me. You know, you just, you have a moment and you think about it and it's always different, you know? So that's, that's really the biggest thing for me about conscious grief is like people think about like getting over something or moving on, but it's not really, the case. It's really a relationship that is constantly changing. And so you can't just have like a year or two and then you're like, okay, that should be over there in the past. It's something you have to kind of revisit over and over again throughout the years because it evolves along with you. So I think it's worthwhile to think of it as kind of a lifelong process. Very wise words. Thank you. Thank Thank you you so much, Mason. Is there anything else that you feel cool to say before we wrap up at all? I don't think so. Yeah. It's been great. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much for, you know, being here and being vulnerable and, and sharing your story. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. To everybody who's been watching. Bye-bye.